sometimes when you're traveling uh, to a foreign land, um, you think you know things from what you were taught in school, and then you find out that's not how they say it, and they're actually speaking. The people that you're hanging out with are speaking in a slang term or just their, their local dialect. And so Gabrielle Uvino is joining us on Big Blend Radio Champagne Sunday show today to talk about her book, What They Didn't Teach You in Italian Class, Slang Phrases for the Cafe, Club, Bar, Bedroom, Ball Game, and More. It's one of the new editions of the What They Didn't Teach You in Class series by Ulysses Press. And that series also includes books covering French, German, Russian, and Spanish. Of course, you can get them on Amazon, Goodreads, all those great places. Gabrielle is an adjunct professor of Italian and cross-cultural communication. She's a professional translator and interpreter. She's going to teach me uh, how to say her name correctly. And she's the author of several books on learning Italian, including The Complete Idiot's Guide to Learning Italian. So welcome to the show, Gabrielle. How are you? Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Buona, hey, buongiorno. Da- well, buongiorno. So now, did I say your name correctly, or do yes, I need help? Yes, you did. It really depends on where we are, but here in the States, um, it's uh, Gabriele, Gabrielle, Gabriele in Italia, so as long as it's said with love. <laughs> oh, I love that. And, and you vino, because that, does that mean you have wine in your family? Like it, uh, My father was very proud of our name. He used to say, it means fine wine. <gasps> yes. So, I um, like it. I, I, I wish I were a better, more of a connoisseur in wine because I do have the name for it. Yeah, mm. you do. Yeah, you do, and you belong on Champagne Sundays. And, you know, <laughs> some of the best wines we've had have come from Italy. You know, we had uh, Rufino, uh, mm. the winemakers, on our show when we first started our show years ago. And Yummy wine. It was so fascinating yeah. to hear just about Italy, which I've never been to Italy. And you haven't. I just find it, we've had a lot of travel writers that come on our shows talk about it and to me, it seems so historic and cultural and part of, you know, even going through your book, which is so super fun. And I think with <laughs> kids, like, spring break, travel, whether all ages, but especially for a um, younger generation getting out there and travel, it's going to be a fun way of learning. But what I got from your book is that we actually need to understand the culture to understand the language. Exactly, exactly. And how do you learn about the culture but through the language? Yeah, which, which you don't get in the, in in the textbook because it wouldn't be an appropriate form for that, and yeah. um, and yet it is the most sort of real, vital part of language. It's the most elemental. You know, when you hit your thumb with a hammer, mm. you you know, butterfly. You know, you don't. <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's it's natural. It's part of our DNA, I think. And uh, mm-hmm. so I kind of just try to tap into that from um, both from a cultural and anthropological perspective and a linguistic perspective, but making it super real and fun. And um, and I hope I've mm. been successful. I think so. It's fun because I I get to say culo now, and I learned culo living in Mexico. I got I got to say it. I wanted to say it. I said it at the beginning of the show, and I'm saying it again. Culo, culo, culo. <laughs> oh, that's really okay. funny. That's really funny. Well, that's also called um, the end of a piece of bread. Oh, really? It's called the culo. That's the butt end. It's the butt. It's the butt. The butt of the bread. Yeah. The heel. See, we're American, so, it's, so we it's say heel. It's actually not as vulgar when you actually look at how we use language in English. You're not That's thinking of a little tiny hiney on the end of your bread there. It's the butt. It's the end. It's like an elbow. <laughs> so. it, it, you know, it, <laughs> now I'm looking at an elbow a completely different way. It's oh, Joe no. the plumber. No, isn't this well, because, this is what happens this, to me, too. After a while, we're a every, Puritan nation. Okay. <laughs> you know. You know, I mean, really, when you think our history is puritanical, and so we're pure, and so we're not going to do anything, I mean, that that's natural. <laughs> well, you know, uh-oh. Uh, well, I did a that's turn a paper very, on, yeah, on I never the thought about F the word, word before. Yeah. See, mm-hmm. I learn something every day in every conversation because of etymology. Yeah. Oh. See, that's cool. So, but I mean, I did a term paper on the on the F word. Because it's really an abbreviation, and we were always in kids so, in so much trouble for saying it that we just said it more. Because the more trouble you got in, the funnier it was. And <laughs> so I, this 
this country has, you know, I'm going to ask you now about Italy. Do they care about swearing as much as we care about it here? Well, of course they do. I mean, it, 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 it's blasphemy, right? Mm-hmm. So if you okay. want to go to profound, and that's where, um, and in the book I really tried to clarify, like, don't, mm-hmm. this is not, don't use this language, but know mm-hmm. when it's used, what it means, right? Right. Um, and I had yeah, to figure yeah. out categories so that I could sort of include everything that was important and also distance myself from its usage, which was a tough balance as a writer. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were, and I think there still are laws on uh, using profanity in front of the public, in the you know, public sphere, if you are um, uh, certainly in an, with an authority. There mm-hmm. are even cases when people have been called out for using allusions to vulgar without even <laughs> using the vulgar terms. Wow. Because we, you know, and including that language and talking about it on the radio, it's, it's very different in a book than it is on the radio because <laughs> I realize <laughs> and yeah. it's been in. And I argue with my, my, my own kid about this. Um, I did find myself swearing more after I wrote the book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like fun. Something I mean, because was liberated in me, I guess, you know. <laughs> but, because, yeah, the language is such a, it's, it's musical, and it can go another way, different ways. In, in South Africa, I learned Afrikaans, and we always said, and you talk about it, Italian almost being a vulgar language in your book. In, in South Africa, Afrikaans, to me, is like one of those best languages. If you want to swear about something, it's like, it's got the rrr and the chaz and the, you know, there's this, this you know, demonstrative thing about it. And some of the stuff is so, like, especially if you directly translate it, that's, that's, a, that's like vulgar. really bad. Whereas... <laughs> It's like they they will have your mother's uterus, and I can't say it. it, it but when they well, when they but it's not meant to. It's really not uterus, but they go your mur. I mean that's a. It's like you can't. It doesn't matter where you are. You already know someone's saying something bad. Yeah. Like you know just by the, you know the way it's said. It's, yeah, well, it's elemental. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. It's primal speak. And um, we can mm. pretend it doesn't exist, but it's there, and yeah. mm-hmm. it's used all the time. And mm. even um, by including some of the euphem, like my favorite, and I have to learn a lot of the English, to be honest with you. This was an education for me. Oh, I, wow. I, um, when I shared with my brother that I was going to be writing this, he, he looked at me and he, he just started to laugh. You? Because <laughs> I had always been the hoity-toity in the family. And uh, you wouldn't know that because, as you can see, I've liberated myself a little. But um, I learned so much about English. And um, and actually, I am inspired to do a book all about the history of swear words in general because cool. it's, it's – Fascinating. It's, it, it is a fascinating evolution and then mm-hmm. how things have come to be – in negative ways or how they've come to be taken back and reclaimed mm. because of the power yeah. of a word. And mm. um, this dialogue happens all over and everywhere, and it's a good one to mm. have because it's really essential, like how we talk to each other when we're not writing a paper, when we're not presenting for, um, for work, when we're not putting a memo out, but really just how people talk to each other when they're in the kitchen mm-hmm. and like the book describes, you know, everywhere else. Mm. I think it is fascinating because it tells the, it tells the history of cultures. Uh, you know, when you look at etymology, it's so fascinating to me. And um, way back when I used to do jewelry design and I got into the history of beads. And so the jewelry design went out the window and all of a sudden I'm writing a book about jewelry, the beads and the shells and what this shell meant and this color, depending on what culture, and all of a sudden it was like, they were I'm going to end up doing it. You'll, you'll end up doing this for the rest of your life because it's so fascinating, but it tells yes. people's stories. Um, in in your book, what I what I found very interesting 
is we were talking about um, that there are gay and lesbian communities in Italy. So a lot of, you know, if, if you're gay and lesbian, you're going to be wanting to look for that, right? Um, but you have to know how to speak, you know, having lived in, in, well, in this country, we still have a lot of growth to do. Um, in South Africa, when I was going through high school. <laughs> the world, I think. But, yes. Yeah, yeah, the world. <laughs> of there, growing to do. Yeah. Yeah, there's a religious thing over there where so it's highly religious. You have the Dutch church and you have all these different religions, but and that was what really um, kept people quiet about, you know, their sexuality and their love preference. And it, and it well, was, I, I, I mean, think people were getting hurt. So there's a way to communicate with that. Yes, well, there are lots of ways people communicate who they are in subtle ways that I've come to appreciate. So it's interesting going back to your mention of the beads and the shells, mm. because remember, these were the first currencies. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Of course, yes. I'm sure yeah. you, you came across that. And so these mm-hmm. were the objects that people carried with them through the mountains and down into the valleys. And they were novel and they were new and they were useful and they were beautiful. And they came from far away. So they, had, they came to become a currency. And that exchange is what language is and, and mm-hmm. what symbols are. And, and so knowing when to use language... Sometimes if you insert a particular um, dialect word, you would let somebody know you were from their area. Um, mm. Just the insert, just the way somebody uses an R or uh, makes the sound of a T or a D, all these subtleties were essential to understanding who were your friends and who were your enemies, right? Wow. So... Mm. The way I parlay everything now and the way I, I'm trying to sort of take what my particular angle is and share it more with people in a sometimes lighthearted way, but it's a really very mm. important, essential, powerful yes. um, method to step back, you know, and realize like a lot of the time people may not even know what they're communicating because one person, a color represents one thing and another cult- culture, it means something else. One word might be used very benignly, and then you find mm-hmm. out that a hammer isn't just a hammer in all languages. It has all sorts of other meanings. Those illusions are what get us into the body, but it is the body and the naughty that brings all of us into existence. Mm. So, <laughs> you, know. you have chapters on um, this. <laughs> No, but it's the profane and the sacred. Yes. It's all of the above, because I also honor the sacred. And, mm-hmm. you know, this is why there are places and times and, you know, sort of not condoning things, but like you mentioned, going back to if you are from a marginalized group of people, mm-hmm. then you are probably wise to uh, be alert to your environment and the art, which is lost right now in um, the understatement. Because yeah. <laughs> we're yes. all like, eh, let's share everything. We can blog about it and talk about it and write about it. And share. And people are also, like, I'm looking like, what's the most efficient communication in a world that's saturated? Saturated. So then it brings you back mm. to uh, just multiple levels of becoming present. And I think that going back to the psychological benefits of swearing they help us <laughs> vent they let it out uh when you usually express something it's done mm-hmm. hopefully um and so like there's a lot of health benefits to it that i didn't really get a chance to talk about but i could mention here as well in the currency of life like your beads and shells <laughs> yeah well it's apparently you're, you're smart too they say geniuses come from swear or really smart people swear <laughs> let's oh, put that, it that, that way that's, that's, that's quite a funny. compliment thank you uh I, I, <laughs> or crazy, <laughs> that's you how know? i feel you know guess gabrielle this is the one thing that i find also really interesting when you talk about these subtleties that it's so important i think um we we and yeah, Jamie Kat Killan, who was on our show just over a week ago when we were talking about, uh, she wrote Parisian Charm School. And and I was like, oh, oh, I'm in trouble because I'm a tomboy, <laughs> man. But anyway, so she was talking about how uh, Parisians talk, how there's a subtlety and a flirtatious side. And um, you talk about this too. And I think that we've become 
now I look at our American culture, society now, I've, Nancy and I talk about this a lot. Mm. We, are, um, we both talk a lot. We, we're, we are outspoken and loud, but there's a loudness that there's like this wall of sound where I feel, I don't know if it's because Nancy and I spend a lot of time either writing or creating or being out in nature, but we find like uh, people to be very loud, almost on the obnoxious level, where it's this nonstop same tone, monotone of loudness, so it's either that or you're getting emojis, and I feel like we've lost this dynamic in how we speak. And when we look at these ancient languages, uh, Italian, uh, French, you know, Spanish, that we can really learn not just a new language but actually having a dynamic to how we speak so we actually are heard and um, that people will listen longer if we have a little bit of that dynamic in culture. <laughs> You know, um, that's wonderful. I commend you. I support you, and I'm honored to be in your circle here because those are the things that matter the most to me as well. And uh, and I have traveled. I've I've had amazing experiences around the world. I mean, mm. truly gorgeous experiences in all walks of life, and um, and and the shared humanity of being here in this world at this time is um, mm. a constant kind of miracle to me that I, I could get into a, a machine that would carry me through the sky, bring me into a completely different world with a different language. And um, I went looking to feel like a foreigner, actually. I wanted to know what it was like to be, to stand out, let's say, to be um, an outsider. And here's what I discovered no matter where I went, I felt included. So um, the, the bounty and the generosity of strangers with me bearing all just good intentions showed me that um, our, common, our common experience is, 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 is universal. And um, we've just never had so much exposure at once um, and I think it's it's overwhelming, but learning a second language is to learn your own language. You can't understand your own culture until you step out of it. You can't understand anything. You know, and Alan Watts talks about this, you know, the mm-hmm. contrast of existence and all of this uh, law of attraction, whatever the, uh, you know, Christian the belief door. system. Walking through Islam, the door and Muslim, then realizing whatever. there was you none. Know, Buddhist, <laughs> um, but it's all of the people that were coming in contact with the stranger and there are countless examples in history, in Italy being in the middle of what was the earth, the middle of the earth, Mediterranean, right, Mediterraneo, mm. in the middle of the earth. So it was a crossroads, and it still is a crossroads of all places, all cultures, all languages. Mm. And so these guttural things that you would hear through the street, like those are the first words you learn because those are the ones that, People are just uttering left and right, you know, as they live their lives. And mm. um, then somebody thought, like, like, let's write some of this down. And those books were banned for a long time. Boccaccio, who wrote the Decameron, he was banned for centuries. Um, so if you don't know who he is, uh, he's worth checking out if you're interested in Italian mm. culture and history. He was like the bad boy of the, you know, the, the, the mid, Middle Ages Renaissance in terms of his language. Um, hmm. And this was the vulgar language, meaning it was the language of the people, not vulgar the way we think of it, but vulgar meaning of the people like the Vulcans. I think mm-hmm. Star Trek even took the name probably from this. <laughs> like when you start looking at language, you find it, you find it exactly. everywhere. You know, um, when I want to go back to what you said about, you know, you felt welcome everywhere mm-hmm. you went. And Lisa and I have traveled a bit, and, and we we travel in a different kind of mode than other people. We end up living in the countries. Or places. <laughs> and we places, moved for a while. Yeah, where we moved. Um, you know, we, we travel, and then we're like, oh, let's just stay here. And yes. kind of oh, that's attitude. Wonderful. And And what we learned was we were always surrounded by strangers to start with, and it is the attitude that you go with. That is how you are going to be treated. I used to lead tours of, of Americans over to Kenya, 
before we decided to live there. And I could see in a group of people that you take over, I took over 30 at a time. That's and a big group. The, yeah, and the first time I was like, I, I had ne- actually, honestly, had never even been to Kenya before, but I was the tour guide, which th- that makes a lot of sense. But I was excited to go because I wanted so much to see African wildlife. I, and I, I always wanted to had, go. <laughs> oh, I had no idea of how to lead a tour or what kind of people there would be. So the first tour was a huge learning curve. The second tour, I could earmark who's going to be a problem, who's going to have a bad time, who's got an attitude. And I remember on one tour taking a psychologist. Oh, my gosh. What? Just stay home. (laughs) Just stay home if you're going to be like that. I mean, he was so irritating and so everybody was beneath him. And his experience, he left in three days because he couldn't couldn't handle the looks he got, and he got the looks because not only did he speak horribly but and and down to everybody, like it's not, can I have some bread? I don't suppose I can have some bread. There's a difference there. Um, he looked down on people, and his body language just mm. said, you're beneath me. And it came off, even if you couldn't understand English, the people knew what he was doing. And, and so there is an attitude that goes how you speak. That, yeah. that your body language and your tone of voice, your inflection, how you look at people. Um, well, humility is necessary to try. Yeah. If it's not there to start with, then there's already an automatic um, reflex um, mm-hmm. for those of us on the receiving end of that behavior that pushes yeah. back. You know, yeah. The word um, snob, and, and mm. I could be wrong about this, but I, I hope not. I believe means without nobility. Mm. Because huh. that's right. You, so, so sin nobilitate or something Latin. Um, mm. So, if you look at the origins, and I love this, if you look at the origins of a snob, they are the absolute opposite of noble. Because wow. a true noble person doesn't need to push or uh, impose or even impress or prove anything, mm. right? Mm. Yeah. When you meet but, someone who's truly noble, those kings, queens, princes, princesses, yes. we've all met them. Um, mm. These are people who you don't, they may be the janitor. Okay. It doesn't matter who that person, what their job is. You see in their mm. eyes, they know mm. who they are. Mm. Yeah. And that's, that's right. I, I agree. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I agree. Look at Lady Diana when she, Diana, when, when you know, we, we lived in England, right? When she was getting married to Prince Charles, and we watched how, and you look at her sons now, and everybody can have their thing about the royal family of England. That's a whole other topic. But she changed the outlook. She was a she younger did, lady. She's a perfect entering, example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she went. Out, she didn't example. care for. She held a child with AIDS, and the child drooled mm-hmm. on her, or whatever. That was. She didn't care about that. Whereas a snob would be like. Oh no! Don't don't you know? Don't put her, your her on universe, me. Yes, her humanity was something mm. that was mm-hmm. um, so beloved. We just, of course, we need that. <laughs> we mm. all need to know it exists, and then it's usually easier to get there ourselves. Mm. But we have to be it in order to um, to elicit it. So I call upon yeah. everyone who. Um, wants that to continue to, you know, like, what do you do? How do you change a hateful person into somebody who's loving? <laughs> you know, how do you? You don't, do you you don't become can. a hateful person back to them. Yeah. Well, you know, you that's just right. And, you know, representing the good. The truth of whatever it is, like, truth is so arbitrary, I suppose. But yeah. the truth of any situation, it always rises to the surface. It's there. And uh, it gets a up, I can't even say the word obfuscated a lot by uh, doublespeak and uh, mm. rhetoric and, you know, mm-hmm. that's propaganda and all of this. But if you become a cunning linguist, haha, mm. and you, you go, look girl. at. <laughs> 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 and you look at the language from from all angles and and you say all right you know something i'm going to be the i'm going to be the change i'm going to be what i want to resonate in the world and mm. and then if you can make people laugh because you could be the most righteous person on the planet if you're not f- 
fun, p- people are going to tune you out. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, right, right. that's why we have champagne on Sundays. So you know, have it's some, about ooh, some attitude some and, and yeah, some bubbles. Have some some sass. Have and, some and, bubbles. That's right. Well, that <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to touch on this too. Going back to the etymology of a word, and and also when you were talking about nobility and versus snobbery, right? Uh, yeah. Because it is. How, it's interesting how the snobs took over. Like, ooh, look at me! Um, it's a, it's the <laughs> it's the takeover of the wannabes, um, or, or the has-beens later. But <laughs> but but um, but what what is interesting to me? You talk, and you've got a chapter on dining and desserts, and we talk about you know you know we've got all the cooking channels and and all that. And um, the one thing I wanted to touch on when you were talking about it, the the, the language of the common people. Would, mm-hmm. would be the vulgar term or it was slang or it's a local dialect. It, it's this is how you know, and one side of Italy will be different than the other side, right? How they how the, you know happens, but it is about the common people, and it's so funny because in food, you look at now, especially in Europe, peasant food is now being celebrated as like we should be doing this because we're using all the animal parts and all the parts of a vegetable, or mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And now it's being celebrated in like wow. Gee, we don't have to like you know, be snobs and not eat everything that, that has been grown or raised, kind of well, thing. Well, I think so there's, you know, it's interesting. It's the same. Snobbery is me. always coming. You know, to take a psychological perspective. It's it's almost always coming from a really deeply embedded inferiority complex. Insecurity, yeah, insecurity, yeah, Absolutely. right. Oh, yeah. where bullies come from. So yeah. even you know your your participant in that trip was probably just so terrified. You know mm-hmm. the world <laughs> they mm. have to control everything, but I wanted to yeah. just uh, back up and say this is not the language of the common people, even if that's what I said. That really, what I want to say is commonly spoken. Mm-hmm. Yes, because no one is common. If you, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, we're all still the center of our own universe, right? So, I mean, some guys, some somebody might say, "Yeah, I'm just an average person," but that just means. You um, you share a lot with people, but like we commonly spoken language, which is the origins of everything of community, communion, commune, all the co- all the cooperative enterprises require their this this commonality, which is language. It's the lingo. And it's the lingo. So in Italy, before people traveled, they all lived in mountainous areas, and it was hard to get there, and so all these dialects. Um, cropped up, and um, it was all coming from Latin, and all of these various visitors through Rome, which was 2,000 years ago, it had a million inhabitants, just to understand what that Mm. meant then. We take it for granted now, but Mm. it was, today you can go to Rome and you can feel how Mm. it was 2,000 years ago. You can find those old walls, you can find those remnants, and so the language are those seeds, those shards of history that have mm. come with us through time that are metaphors. So they're living, jagged, spoken word poetry. And, it, um, mm. and so when you look at it from that perspective, there's no shame because you're, you're recognizing it. It's just simply... Mm. Giving a place in history, but, yeah, in life know, now. Who decided... Like, okay, that's a swear word, that isn't. That's a really crude word, that isn't, you know. Who decided what was a good word and what was a bad word? That's a great question. Um, There's a wonderful movie called Cinema Paradiso. Cinema Paradiso. It's one of my favorite, favorite movies of all time. I Mm. highly recommend it. Um, And there's a mastered and a remastered version. Um, It's got all the elements of Italian film, drawing from the neorealists, Fellini. But in that movie, um, there's a priest with a bell who actually sits in a movie theater and rings the bell, censoring those first movie clips. No and way. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a very humorous look at the times and how life progresses and things change. But who was he? He was the town priest, and he was protecting the younger people from what were adult behaviors. Mm. And mm-hmm. like even censorship still had in its um, in its root kind of a desire to protect. So everything is still coming from fear. So who decides 
um, the people just start using stuff, and you hear it, and it's usually, like you said, you know the swear words even if you don't understand what they're saying. You know if somebody's swearing. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Right? In any language, yeah. it's pretty obvious. Yeah. So in, in somebody South Africa, decides I had to write some, it down. Mm. In South and, Africa, I had some employees when we had a magazine there, and um, some spoke Afrikaans. Mostly they spoke English because that's what I spoke. But and they were English speaking, but when they wanted to swear, or they didn't want me to know what they were saying, they spoke off of cons. And but I could still tell, but I didn't really care. And then mm-hmm. I had one employee whose daughter would show up <laughs> before the end of the work day, and she came to me and was like, "They're swearing, and I don't want my daughter to hear that." So I said, "Well, that's easy. Don't have your daughter show up while you're still at work." Because they were happy, and it was a big joke, and I really didn't know pretty much what they were saying. I really didn't care because they were doing the job and doing it well. And it, it was interesting because she was highly, highly offended about the, the language being used. And she, she said she came from the best of the best of the best families. Oh, here we go. And <laughs> we cannot tolerate this. We, the royal we, cannot tolerate this kind of language. Two days after... Her father was in the newspaper for embezzling money from a baseball um, club that he had purchased. So I was like, that's the best, the best, swear on. And, and it's interesting. Well, that's the royal hypocrisy. We. Yeah. What is it with that? We. The royal we. It's almost like you can't oh, the just royal back we. up your own thing. Yeah. The royal we. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> it's like we're well, not going to go on our own. We, believe. we have to have the whole family. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's just not my opinion. It's everybody's. Everybody. But yours. Yeah, exactly. We believe. I think that's called gaslighting. We all believe. It doesn't mm. matter what you believe. <laughs> we. That's intimidating, yeah. right? We. It, oh. It, it's interesting, and, Gabrielle. I want to ask, what led you into the world of language? Because. It's, it's To me, it's really fascinating, mm. and I get everything muddled up because, like I said about Kulo, and I was, I was laughing about that because it was one of the first <laughs> things they taught me in Mexico. And, and going from Mexico, we'd only been in this country about a year, a year and a half, and then lived in Mexico. And I actually was having a hard time with learning Spanish, but I was learning from the people, which was, was interesting and, and so much fun. fun. <laughs> However, because, and we had friends that came over that spoke Castilian, Spanish, and uh-huh. they were having a hard time. But the, the reality was the culo, okay, so now when this, this is one of the first things I saw in your book, and I started giggling. I'm like, yay. But in Spanish, I was having a hard time because some of the words were the same as in Afrikaans yes. over in Africa because of Latin. It's, it's the, the, the Latin language. I goes meant the same all thing. Over. Yeah. And I meant the same. Pretty so much, they yeah. Shared, Pretty much. They shared etymological roots then. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. See, and it, it, it's Italy went everywhere in history. And if there's, if there's a publisher listening now, I, w- I would love to do a children's book on etymology. <laughs> on swearing? Yeah. No, etymology. No, I love it. Etymology. This. Yeah, because. Entomology. Do you know what the difference is that's between entomology and etymology? One's insects. Brava. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Nature geek here. I'm a nature person. <laughs> <laughs> and we're so in the desert. Be... We have scorpions. We study it. <laughs> this is where we would start. Yeah. Oh, we could do a whole show on it, actually, because it, 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 what this does, when you look at etymology and why I'm so curious about language starts with my my childhood i always wanted to learn i loved language so much i used to make up language mm, like as a okay. kid pretending i could speak cool. a foreign language I, and, cool. and i would do this with my friends and 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 we could understand each other perfectly fine speaking babble you know yeah. okay okay you know what? The language for you is Swahili. Mm. And the reason I say that, when we went, no, this is so much fun. Okay. It, when we went to Kenya, we, we had to learn, well, we didn't have to, but we elected to try to learn Swahili. And I thought, this is going to be so easy. There's, at the time, there was only 150 words. So how, how hard can that be? Well, and it's so much fun. Because in Swahili, because there's only 150 words, everything was a big story. And they're like, how come it takes two hours for a person to tell you something (laughs) and for you to understand it when there's only 150 words? 
because you had to sit and listen and like they would tell you like um, airmail is there's a piece of paper, somebody wrote some words on it, we're not sure what it means yet, and then it gets in this big bird that looks like it's made out of iron, and then it floats over the land and the sea, and we don't know how it does it, and then when it thinks it should, it should land, and it goes on and on and on until you get the letter. And then oh, wow. somebody else will tell you a whole different story about what airmail means. It's crazy, crazy, because it is really creative in that you are so limited to just 150 words that you have to sit and listen to the story to know what the person's trying to say. I love it. I love it, too. And they probably didn't do um, a lot of gossiping. Because well, it I don't know about that. Two hours out of their day to tell the story. <laughs> well, I think they gossip. They could look at each other and yeah. go. There's like shortcuts. Yeah, there's shortcuts. There's shortcuts to it. But but that's what's so interesting. But I want to go back to etymology versus entomology. Like you were saying yeah. that you know going back as a kid. I mean, are you? If, are, is that something you would do in a children's book that you would put the two together? So that I would put you know, the. Th- the, the, my daughter does this now in school, and it's helped her enormously with her memory retention. And, um, and truly, like I believe this is, could revolutionize the way children learn. And we don't get a lot in school on how to actually acquire information. Mm-hmm. And this is something I'm really interested in, language acquisition, and what's efficient communication. So Swahili, for example, is an incredibly efficient language mm-hmm. considering the elements it has to work with. Right. Um, English and etymology and entomology, and going back to the Latin and the Germanic roots that we have in English, brings you automatically into the greater world. So by looking at roots and looking at prefixes and endings, you mm. can instruct um, anybody to be aware of it. And then once you're aware of it, you don't have to learn all the time over and over again. It's like you have this pair of glasses, you put them on, now you see things in a certain way, and Everything mm-hmm. goes from there. So it's, it's, it's very, you know, it's a good use of your time because it's a paradigm. So take, for example, my uh, brother and I were having a conversation years ago, and he said, okay, so what's the difference, he said, between oviparous and viviparous? Mm-hmm. Your nature, people. It has to do with how the snakes give birth, or it's, not just snakes, sharks do it. It's, it's alive smell birth and, or it, eggs. Smell and, and, and um, taste. And <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> Don't eat the birth. <laughs> it's the difference between a boa constrictor and a python. Right. So yeah, it's, a, it's the birth, yeah. Okay, so right? a python is an oviparous snake, and a boa constrictor is an, wait. Viviparous. It's a viviparous. Viviparous. Right, yeah. so one gives live birth, one lays eggs. See, mm-hmm. I win. I win, Nancy. I get another <laughs> bottle of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do. I look out at nature and I I, I talk to the birds and and I think about cool. these things. Um, but there's there's real value in it because if you're trying to learn and there's so much stuff to know out there, so many great things to know. More and more mm. now we have all the libraries of the entire world available to us. We can't possibly know everything. So I think we're going to become specialists. And my specialty is how people transcend time and distance through language. And I think that's a noble pursuit because, um, you know, it's common. Everybody does it. And I, I, I was actually writing down some notes about my, my inspiration. Mm-hmm. Um, can, I, can I just share with you? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, I said, uh, I wrote, this is my scribble. Uh, language is the singularly most important element for the evolution of our species. Yet we take it for granted. We use it, and things happen. Um, But when we began writing, we were able to communicate over distance and time, just a bunch of lines, and the Mm. world changed. Um, And then I wrote art and the alphabet and architects. Um, So, you know, when you look at language as, like, air for humans, like we could not do anything without it, then by just taking one element, yeah, it's dirty, it's naughty, it's body, and guess what? I just got your teenager curious to know about a foreign language, and they start giggling, and they start reading, and um, 
then they hmm. find a book on it and they go, oh, this stuff's funny. And I want to go get an ice cream. And they're 18 and they're 19 and they're 20 and they're 57 and 60 and they're still laughing. Then I think um, I think people should have more fun with grammar. It, it doesn't have to be this dry, pedantic yeah. um, um, a lexicon of, 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 of what we consider to be maybe an elitist uh, sort of platform. Um, it is vital that one knows the difference between legal language and what you can speak in the street. It, that's essential for the world. Like anybody mm-hmm. that doesn't understand that isn't going to be able to function at, uh, you know, at maximum efficiency in the world. But if you are going into a little bodega somewhere or you, you're in a little tiny shop somewhere and, and, and you just want to be able to um, banter about, then I say listen to the people, listen to how they talk. Mm-hmm. Like two friends talking about, you know, smack talk about their other friend or somebody complaining That's about cool. their partner. It's cool. Or, you know, it is cool. It's cool then. Well, but I think I think it's it's so important because it's about being personal versus yeah, there's the stuff that you do if you're in, in Italy on business or any country on business. It's a little different about yeah, what what needs to be in your contract and, and things like that. <laughs> yeah, um exactly. but it, but it's really important to understand what people are saying around you. Number one, it's oh, it's you, important it's no matter what just important. out of um, you talk about fear. Safety. One of the first things to get over fear is to educate yourself and also drop your barriers a little bit and get out of your comfort zone so you can understand what's going on around you and connect. And that is the thing. I think what, what, I love your book because it does drop that, that stuffiness. And people, people need to drop that when they travel because you're not going to have a good, it, you're not going to have a good time if you're stuffy when you travel because travel will boost you or boot you out of your stuffiness comfort zone it it will Mm. it will do it and you might as well be a little bit prepared and i don't know about you but the the reality is you are going to go to a bar or a cafe or if you're traveling and you don't go to a place where you're actually communicating with people you've missed the entire point (laughs) of travel yeah that's 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 a different kind of experience um -hmm. no it sounds like we've had um all of us very similar attitudes going out into the world, which is mm. the, um, I'm 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 a visitor, um, I'm open, and it's very difficult to leave your comfort zone. You know, every time I go on a trip, almost always, um, just before I go on the trip, and it's been a little while, I get so nervous. And I think, oh, my God, I, am I forgetting something? Is the house going to burn down while I'm gone? What's going to happen? Why did I think I was going to have it all together? I haven't paid the bills. I, I, and then I want to just cancel. And then I leave, and I get where I have to be. And um, let's say I'm in Italy, and this world just recedes, and I'm present. Mm-hmm. I'm in the moment, and it's wonderful. So um, That's yeah. cool. Because you don't want to bring all that with you. Exactly. But and and the thing is, I just want to say this. Even though we're talking about swearing, which you know, I'm <laughs> part uh, of it. <laughs> you know, I don't. It, it just because you're aware of what certain words mean never means you have to use them. Mm. And um, in the travels I've had, especially as women, I would be careful about using swear words mm-hmm. and yes. vulgarities. Yeah. Um, but Very it's good careful. to know what someone's really saying, uh, you know, about you or around you, and just so you know what's going well, it's on. it's also in the movies, it's on television. Yeah. You know, so, and, and it is kind of the base way of um, this is what's going on right now. Yeah. Mm. This is where the culture is right now. Um, you know, to understand is is power. Here's the thing, yeah, too. I say power. Take, Take mm-hmm. your book and, and read it. And number one, it's just fun. It is such a fun book to read and to say things outside of your total, like, normal comfort zone of language, right? And it's fun to say. And mm-hmm. I, I think that we should be watching Italian movies or shows to hear it. Like, don't you think we should be doing that? Does, does that help with, with learning? Oh, yeah. And that's a, that's use that with your book? Um, <laughs> it's like well, she got the belly. <laughs> I, you don't know that. What is that? that it, what's her name? Was in that? Um, Sophia Loren. And she's she what? Well, what was the movie? But uh, we'll never forget. I can't remember. But I used to remember all the kids. She's she got, got the belly. belly. She got anyway. the belly. Anyway, <laughs> what was she doing? 
she was walking on, she on the beach and she was pregnant and and all the kids were running around going, she's got, got the, the belly. belly. <laughs> I can't. I, mean, I don't know what the movie was, but that's what stuck in our. We've said this for years and nobody knows what we're talking about. Steve, but it's just Steve Schneider, our Hollywood history. We'll ask him. We'll ask that? him. But she was walking and she was pregnant and she was in Italy, I believe. And every, all the kids were. She got the belly. She <laughs> got the belly. And we thought it was the funniest thing. I'm gonna have to look for this. I you know. know. I'm gonna have to look now too. We're like in the supermarket. She's got the belly. I know. <laughs> Don't say it to her because you can get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Never congratulate a woman on being pregnant if you don't know she's pregnant. Yeah, but she got the Yeah, belly. right? <laughs> <laughs> oh they, do, they do love their mommies in Italy, and they love mothers. Um, I could definitely say that. Um, I, wanna... <laughs> I, I, had, I had some fun when I was um, researching all the different ways that Common objects have, and this is something, another reason why you might want to pick up the book, <laughs> is to just know what fruits and vegetables have other meanings because mm. um, you might very innocently make a comment and a whole room will start to laugh. Mm-hmm. And You want to know what they're laughing at. Banana is a good one. Yeah, we learned that. <laughs> that's, I, we, we, that's yeah, we universal. said that at the, the sh- <laughs> well, It's a smiley face, right? Well, not no. When when we were in South Africa, we said this at the top of the show. So forgive us listeners for to, for saying this again. But uh, we did a tour of South Africa with Nancy's art, and the head of the tourism bureau decided to teach her Afrikaans. And this is when we were first in the country. And so she stood up, all you know, mm. proud, like I've learned my first Afrikaans saying, and it is Vatunyo Pisang and my Fuktaslai. And later, everybody started laughing, and Nancy thought, oh, you know, she's connecting with people. Well, she found out that it means, what is your banana doing with my fruit salad? <laughs> so when you say fruits and vegetables, like for us, like, yes, yeah, we banana. know. You better yes, know. Fruits and vegetables. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and knowing what the euphemisms are, because yeah. – um, they're real, and there's they're, they're silliness. There's a lot of silliness that happens when you start looking at language this way. Um, mm, that's a fun part. That's a fun part, I think. Well, if I had a book like yours, I would never have said it. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I really was, um, especially when it, there were a lot of misogynistic terms, and, and here I am, and most of these books are written by guys, and the mm. first time I started looking around, they were very scatological, and they're, so I'm like, how do I... How do I not like? How do I approach this without saying I believe this is something you can say, because this is not something I would ever want someone to use for me mm. or around me or anybody I care about. And then I realized, oh, I could just make lists of what not to say. <laughs> so throughout the book, I have here's what you should never say in front of somebody's mother or sister. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, right. See, that's ex- yeah, that, that goes down or to the mother's uterus better. again. Right, yeah. which is my own way of saying, yeah, don't say this in front of any woman, okay? Yeah. yeah. This is so I included it, but then it was like, here's what not to say in church. Mm. Here's what not to say, you moron. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Gabrielle, 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 at this time, um, we got we got to ask you what your champagne toast is. What, oh, what are you oh, happy God. about? Oh, I have all right champagne. I actually have a champagne toast to to a few people. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, um, because there's just been a lot of really great stuff happening around here, and um, and I would have to thank the Ulster County Italian American Foundation for being part of it, and also Radio Kingston because I've been co-hosting a yeah. show now called cool. Tutto Italiano on Radio Kingston 1490, um, thanks to Jimmy Jimmy Buff, and uh, and and I love my job at the Culinary Institute because I get to be around all these amazing kids and the chefs and the administration it's just such a an incredible organization that blends the best of all worlds in my mind food mm-hmm. language learning history she um, said the blend yeah you said blend so we give you an sh- extra champagne toast for that and of course oh <laughs> thank you and you are the blend so um what a what a pleasure it's been to talk to you i hope we get to speak soon and maybe we can take a trip together Okay, let's go party. We'll go. Let's, we'll, let's go to Italy. We'll go let's somewhere go to Italy. You want to go to Italy? Yeah. 
Oh, Can we go to Italy? I like that. Let's go. I'll take you. Okay. Uh, I would we'll love go. to go to Italy with you. You want to go? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I want to go. Yeah. Okay, before okay. you go, yeah. if you were to take a one-hour walk, because we're all about people getting out and taking a walk, and you were to take a one-hour walk anywhere in Italy, where would it be? Oh, I would take a walk through Rome. With who? With who? Oh, my gosh. Um, in Italy, my mm. friend Giovanni Distillo. So it's Giovanni, not Giovanni. Giovanni, yes. He's a Giovanni. tour guide, and Ooh. he's amazing. So he works for EF Tours, and he's a dear friend, and he knows everything about everything. Uh, oh, and nice. he's smart and kind and truly one of the wisest people I've ever met. So, yeah, I'd like to walk through Rome with you, Giovanni. Ooh, I, I want to go around saying that. <laughs> that like no, he's not that. For, no, you. Giovanni, and I love his wife. I love his family. We are very connected. <laughs> Please don't. She's no. I know, I'm just I know. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just teasing you. I'm just teasing we you. We studied together thing, you know? 30 years ago. We were students, young students in Italy together in Urbino. Oh, wow. And cool. uh, we've had a friendship all these years. And they are my dear, for dear, dear his wife, Ermeline, and I, I love that family so if i if i had an hour to walk around with somebody who could really tell me so much about the history and the place uh in all languages because he speaks like eight or ten of them that would be giovanni awesome so, awesome yeah. thank you so much gabrielle it has been such a pleasure having you on the show everyone gabrielle uvino it's e-u-v-i-n-o uh google That's her she's right. got like twenty thousand books on italy she knows everything on this, you know, so go check her out. Check, uh, but check this my, is the um, latest. What they didn't teach you in Italian class, slang phrases for the cafe, club, bar, bedroom, ball game, and more. So check it out. It's through Ulysses Press, and uh, I think it's so cool that they did this series, too. So check it out, and, mm. of course, go to Amazon, all those great places uh, to get the book. But thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, and thank you both, and thank you especially um, to Ulysses Press for making all of this happen. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, how do I say goodbye now? Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Did I do that right? Brava, si, and ciao. 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 Ciao.